OK, since we have another minute or two, we'll. Yeah, we have a slow. People are trickling in. We're at 46. Nice. Hi, everybody. Always, uh, one of the things at the conference they were always saying is don't punish the people that are on time. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, oh, you know, I never thought of it that way. You know, I always think, oh, let's give some more people time because I don't want to have to repeat stuff. But it's like, no, that's not fair. So. I always say don't punish the prompt. Yes. <laughs> right. I don't know. We're pro are we prompt? I'm a, I think I have I have seven. I don't know what y'all. Yep, seven right on the dot. Seven right seven. on the dot. Okay. All right. Well, good evening for those of you that are joining us this evening. I'm Susan M. Hart Servideo. I'm one of the horticulturists at the Rutgers Cooperative Extension in Ocean County. And with us tonight as uh, our another panelist, Patty um, Dixon from also a uh, horticultural consultant from the county. And uh, Amelia Valente, who will be our speaker this evening, is also our 4-H agent, but has um well, we'll give you all the background about her history behind there. <laughs> um, and uh, just uh, Amelia, since you've joined us in this past year, it has been a wonder, um, wonderful to have you with us. And your enthusiasm is very catching. Oh, thanks. It's been lovely right. working with the both of you. And thank you guys so much for having me. Yeah, so welcome. So, so you're going to present a backyard reptile tonight. Um, for those people that are joining us, you can read in there that uh, videos and microphones have been disabled. So if you have questions or comments, please put them in the chat uh, or the Q&A, but please direct it to either every um, everyone or I think your options are usually panelists, all panelists. Um, our next program will be uh, a month from today. Um, pruning not a mysterious art with Bruce Crawford, who was the former director of the Rutgers Gardens um, and is now the state's coordinator for home horticulture programming, I believe. I probably messed that up, but I'll get that right next time. <laughs> so uh, on that note, Amelia, yeah. I'm going to let you uh, take it away. And uh, Patty and I will be here to answer questions and you will have some breaks or, or there'll be some some activities going along with our program this evening. Awesome, awesome. Well, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, like Sue said, my name is Amelia Valenti, and I'm really looking forward to teaching you about backyard reptiles and all the fun information that comes with it. But before that, let's just do a quick introduction of who I am. Um, I am the 4-H Program Associate of Ocean County. As Sue mentioned, I just started last year. Um, but before that, I actually served as Monmouth County 4-H staff. Before that, I used to be a zookeeper of two different areas. Um, currently still a New Jersey wildlife uh, rehabilitation staff. I, I help rehabilitationists that are licensed. Um, I got my degree in uh, conservation wildlife and management for my undergrad. Um, I actually just graduated uh, my uh, graduate degree in organizational leadership and nonprofit management. And all of this happened simply because I was a 4-H member growing up um, as a youth learning about the topics that I'm going to teach you guys today. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, so for this presentation, I've broken it down into two parts. The first is really you're going to go into the types of reptiles that you can find in New Jersey, how to handle them, the dangerous ones and what to look out for, um, who to contact if you need help, and then I'll pause for a brief question. Um, and then the second part will be signs of life that you can find in your garden, animals that you might find aside from just reptiles, and how you can actually um, make your gardens animal friendly and coexist with these wonderful species that we're going to go over. So my first activity today in the chat box, this is a beautiful picture of a garden. I wish it was mine. Um, can you tell me if you were to find a reptile in this photo, where might it be hiding? I'll give you a couple of minutes and then Sue and Patty, um, whenever answers start coming into the chat box, feel free to just read them off. I'll just give it a couple of minutes just to see. I know that typing sometimes takes um, a few seconds. 
And if anyone is just joining us, we're just trying to figure out what, where would you find reptiles in this photo? And in fact, I don't know if you, if it was just me, but I saw, I believe Vanessa just wrote something. Did you guys see yes. that? Vanessa says under the flower box, I have two under the planter and everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. I love that answer. Whoever put that, you are absolutely right. Everywhere. Um, no matter what type of animal it is, every animal loves to hide. And this is not only a beautiful garden picture, I want this to be my backyard someday. Um, but if you can see my cursor, there are spots like this vine under the flowers, um, even under this table. Uh, if this potted plant doesn't have enough drainage for the water um, and there's pools of water, this is a great place for frogs. Um, even under your chairs, they like cool, dark spots. Um, and so this is like the prime space to be in. Plus, what brings all of these different plants, but insects, hence what a lot of reptiles are eating. So it makes a beautiful ecosystem. You can even see with this one here, I love this picture because yeah, it's a work of art, but look at all these um, different clay pots that you have. Again, cool, dry places to hide in these drawers. You're bound to find wildlife, especially reptiles, no matter what, especially if you have something like this. And then there are some people who say to me, oh, you know, we're gonna hang our plants. And to be quite honest, I find this really cool, this design. Um, but you also have to remember that reptiles can climb and they will, and they will hide all in these planters. You cannot escape them. I don't mean to scare you. Um, but even this chair underneath where the metal is and the cushion is also a great place for them to hide. Um, so in this presentation, what I really want to do is tell you how to look out for them, how to move them if they're making you uncomfortable. Um, but know for a fact that if you're planning on having a garden, there's no escaping it. Wildlife's going to be a part of it and it has to be. Okay, so one recommendation that um, I wanted to give you is the New Jersey Wildlife Guide. You can buy this going to um, the Division of Fish and Wildlife website. Um, it's like $7. I really like it because aside from reptiles, it gives you literally everything in New Jersey, which is pretty cool to learn. We have a vast diversity here, um, and it's just really fun to understand the type of animals that are coexisting with you. Um, and you can see it's small. This is like a pocket guide that I would take when I'm hiking. Okay, so what I really want to go into is a couple of things. And obviously, we're going to talk about the most prettiest snakes. I am a snake person. I understand they're not for everyone, um, but I do find them to be uh, just beautiful. Um, and I've broken it down through regions. Obviously, there are a lot of snakes. Um, there's 23 species, in fact. Um, so you're only going to see up oh, as my inbox decides to show up. Hold on really quickly. Sorry, Ben. Come on, computer. Don't you it's always it? different? Don't you love when you're presenting and your inbox decides to show you an email? My goodness. <laughs> you can never escape it either. And no matter how many times you practice, let's go back really quickly. Okay. Come on. Hopefully no one emails me for the rest of this presentation. <laughs> I have broken it down into three categories. North south and throughout so these are just three examples of uh snakes that you can find in the north you have your queen snake your smooth green snake and your eastern smooth um, earth snake again they're beautiful colors i really find uh, snakes to be a work of art um, for your south jersey you have your coastal plain milk snake your northern scarlet snake your eastern king snake and your corn snake i just want to remind friends um if you heard that rednecks to black friend of jack it makes sense look at this rednecks to black rednecks to black even this has a little bit of red and or excuse me black lining next to its red um all making these safe snakes per se and then throughout this entire state, you have your northern water snake, your eastern milk snake, your northern black racer, 
your black rat snakes. So there are all different colors. They're all different sizes. Um, they're all snakes. So either you love them all or you really are afraid of them. I don't blame you because they are quick um, and they're, they're unpredictable and you never know where they're going and you want to be able to uh, control that. So I get that completely. Um, like I had mentioned, there are 23 species of snake in New Jersey. Um, however, really truly there's only 22. I'll tell you why. The queen snake that you can find in the north part of the state, um, it's locally extinct. They really uh, have not been able to locate any of them in the wild for many years. Um, I say that that if you are hiking and you do come across um, one of those, this is the chance to call Fish and Wildlife and report it and really help researchers and scientists out to let them know that, ah, they actually aren't locally extinct. But of course you can find them in zoos. Um, they are not extinct as a species in captivity. So a couple of snake facts too I should mention. Um, most snakes, they're not slimy, they're not wet, they're actually dry, scaly, if you've never touched them before. They are a major ecological role, especially in controlling rats, which uh, have a lot of tick problems, as we all know. Um, so diseases. Um, all snakes can swim. They may not want to, but they can. Um, they don't chase people. They're not designed to go after us. In fact, they don't like us. They think we smell and they want to get away from us more than anything. So for the people who are afraid of snakes, it, it's a mutual relationship. Um, and they rarely travel in pairs. I'll get to that a little bit more later. Um, the only time you're really going to have a negative uh, experience with a snake is um, if it's defending its mate or uh, you cross into its territory, you step on it. Um, you usually are just trying to mind their own business and just do their own thing. So besides snakes, something a little bit more cuter <laughs> are turtles. So um, there are 13 species of turtles in New Jersey. Um, so to the north, again, I've broken it down. You got your wood turtle, your common mat turtle. Um, I think this guy is so cute. In South Jersey, it's called the Eastern Spiny Softshell. They were actually introduced to the state. They are not native. Um, and this beautiful red belly turtle. Oops, come on. There we go. And throughout the entire state, you have the mud turtle, the musk turtle, as well as the spotted turtle. Again, they are beautiful. Um, I just love the different colors that they have. Um, it's all different form of camouflage. Um, nature has really done a great job on these guys. Now, there is one species that is endangered. It's called the bog turtle. You can see um, he's quite small. That's an adult. So you can imagine how they are when they're little. There are less than 10,000 of them in the state currently. Um, they are the official state reptile. Um, other states that have turtles, not necessarily this one, but other states that have turtles as their official state reptile are Alabama, Georgia, Maryland, and Missouri. Um, these guys, you know, the, the name says it all. I'll, most of uh, New Jersey, there are bogs, and this is where these guys are living. What's really cool is if you ever come across a turtle with this little white bump, you might think, oh my gosh, what's wrong with it? This is actually a radio transmitter. A lot of researchers try and track turtles to see exactly where they go, where they're habituating, um, trying to find more populations. So never pull this off um, if you find it. And again, the animal is not sick or in harms. Um, this uh, clay cement, whatever you want to call it, this, this texture that they are keeping the transmitter on the shell, completely harmless. And again, a lot of research has been backed up to ensure that. I think they are quite cute. I am partial to um, the box turtle, but I like them all. So a lot of people wonder what's a turtle and what's a tortoise and can both of them show up in my garden? Truthfully, yes. Um, all tortoises are in fact turtles. Um, they belong to the order Testudines or a Shalonian. Um, basically what that means is it just is a reptile that is encased in a bony shell. I think sometimes people forget that a shell is a part of them. Um, it is not just uh, them living in it like a snail. This is actually real bone. Um, but not all turtles are tortoises. Um, and be that means that there are some that can swim and some that are not designed to swim at all. So this guy right here, the Eastern box turtle, again, my favorite. If you can see the claws on their front, um, they are designed that, you know, to be where dirt is. These are the guys that are digging burrows. They are not designed to swim at all. However, this lovely thing, 
terrifying, <laughs> does like to swim. I could not find a picture of the common snapping turtle's paw up close. And I'm assuming because nobody wanted to get their camera close to this thing's mouth. But if you can see the drawings, they have web feet. This is an animal that is designed to go into the pond. And as far as I'm concerned, they're beautiful, but stay in the pond. Um, I would never want to mess with something like this. Uh, they look like dinosaurs a little bit. But that's truly the difference. So if uh, you find a turtle tortoise, whatever you want to call it, in your garden, uh, please do not throw it into a pond or, believe it or not, some people have told me, into the ocean. They're not designed for that. Um, and again, I will tell you a little bit more further in this presentation on how to move them away from your garden, especially, especially this guy. Um, but some people wonder, like, what are terrapins then? And so really quickly, we have the northern diamondback terrapin. Um, these are turtles. They do swim, um, but they need, like, brackish swampy water. That means half salt, half fresh. Um, and they take time both on land and on uh, in the water. So it's kind of a 50-50. And I think they absolutely are pretty, too. Okay, so um, when it comes to lizards... Um, you have two lizards, the five line skink and the ground skink in New Jersey. Nothing too major about them. Um, again, these are very fast. Uh, during my time living in Florida, I saw lizards everywhere. I have lived my whole life practically in New Jersey. I have never seen one lizard. Um, if you have, I'm actually really interested. So feel free to put that in the chat where you did and when. Um, and for the people who live close by the Pinelands, like I do and Sue and Patty, you're talking about 1.1 million acres of uh, preserved Pinelands. You actually have two reptiles, um, aside from quite a, a lot of different species, but two that are really native to just this area. It's like its own mini ecosystem. You have the northern pine snake and the northern fence lizard. So again, I've only lived in Ocean County for one year now. Maybe I'll have my chance to find a lizard um, in New Jersey because I love hiking the Pinelands. So you might be thinking, okay, now I know which reptiles to look out for in my garden. How on earth am I going to handle it? I don't want it there. I need it moved. And you could think, well, I'll just get a net. <laughs> and I love this uh, illustration because no way is an animal going to just jump willingly in a net and be transported. They're going to think that you are a danger, that you're trying to attack them or eat them. Um, and they're going to do everything in their power to get away from you or attack to defend. Um, so a net really doesn't work. You're just going to cause yourself probably backache trying to swoosh and try to capture them. But it's going to leave both you and the animal frustrated. So it's really, truly, again, not worth it. The best that I have found is your handy dandy broom. Um, go out and get yourself a garden broom that is strictly just for the garden and bring it out with you when you are gardening. Um, I always make it a point to announce to the garden that I have arrived, just saying, hey, I'm here. I do that when I'm hiking too, especially in dense areas, just to let animals know. Most of them can smell us. They can pick up that we are present they can feel our footprints our vibrations but what i'll do with a broom when i'm gardening is just lightly tap the the ground of my garden the bed and make sure nothing is sleeping there and if it is it's it's going to move quickly um, i also like using a garbage can or a bucket and gently just kind of sweeping the animal in there. Um, animals like dark. Um, it means that they're calm and they're safe. So if you put them in a container that is dark, not a see-through container where they can see you, um, they're gonna remain calm and then you can easily move them. Um, when I say move, I mean from your garden, 50 feet to the backyard where there are woods, not five miles away at a local park. Um, how to move to, you can also use the hose. Um, I would not say follow this illustration where it looks like the water is directly hitting the snake, but if you put it around the snake, they don't like the sound, they don't like um, the feel of the water. You're not going to hurt them if you're, again, directly not spraying them. It's going to irritate them enough that they're going to be like, get out of your way. And that way, again, you can remain uh, a far enough distance. Your water, your plants get a little water and then the animal moves and you're fine. Um, just please, <laughs> for everything you do, do not hold a turtle like this especially, or even a snake by its tail. Um, this, this is an animal's body. It does not 
it's not designed to be dragged or lifted like that. Um, so if you have to move a turtle um, per se, especially if it's something like this again, <laughs> I know this man is a professional. That's why he is so calm holding this. I have worked with gorillas. I have worked with tigers. I would not hold a turtle or tortoise like this at all. They, um, they don't have the most long necks, so they cannot lift their necks up and bite you. This actually is the most safe and humane way of lifting a turtle because if you lift it on its side, um, the, their claws might hit you, your hands, and then you might drop them. This way, nothing's touching. You're just holding its shell and you're able to move them. I did mention move before. Um, turtles have uh, an innate sense of um, knowing where they're going. And what I mean by that is obviously if we see a turtle crossing the road, pick it up and keep it on the way that it's going. Um, because if you move them, they're going to be confused. They're not going to know it anywhere where anything is similar to this. Unfortunately, if you buy a house and you decide to garden and Miss Turtle here wants to lay eggs in your garden, um, you know, there's no picking her up and putting her in the back of your car and moving her five miles and going, there you go, Miss Turtle, have your babies here. She will get confused and, and not know where to get food. It's just not a win-win. Um, so when you do move them again, it's just 50 feet in either direction. Um, also, something that you want to consider is um, actually, uh, you know, can you handle these animals? Like, there are many laws right now um, to protect animals is what I'm trying to say. And so um, trapping them um, and moving them actually would be illegal. There are, again, laws um, protecting them. Um, but say you don't want to lift that turtle. You don't want to touch the snakes. Maybe a turtle's already laid eggs. You, you just are like, what am I going to do now? Your best friends are going to be the Division of Fish and Wildlife. Um, they have a licensed re wildlife rehabilitation uh, list, and that is the link. Um, if you just Google New Jersey wildlife rehabilitators, th that list comes up. It's a PDF document, and you can contact people in your county telling you uh, when uh, they can come to help you and uh, they know the perfect strategies on, on humanely moving that. You can probably also call local veterinarians. I'll tell you as a fellow zookeeper, it was very hard um, turning people down because they would call the zoo. I know we have uh, three zoos in New Jersey. Um, there's nothing we could do because we were taking care of our captive animals. We were not wildlife. So I would say avoid calling zoos and more so again, calling fish and wildlife or asking your veterinarian for a recommendation, they will know. So this will be your lifesaver in that department. So let's play another game because I've been talking a lot. Um, most animals, uh, when they're brightly colored, are dangerous. Uh, that means stay away. Um, I'm going to hurt you because in this case, you might have venom. Um, so this is a northern red belly snake. And I'm curious to know, um, do you guys think it is venomous? Yes or no? And I think I rhymed as I said that, and I didn't even mean to. <laughs> I feel like uh, Dr. Seuss right there. I, th I don't see, oh, I see one person just wrote, um, uh, no. Patty, I think I'm gonna get the chat <laughs> if there's anything you can do in the Q&A, because it seems like everybody's sending it directly to me. So um, I see two no's in the chat, two yeses in chat. I see a bunch of no's in Q&A. Awesome, awesome. So um, the answer, and thanks guys for participating, is nope, this is a completely harmless animal. Um, and so just because something is brightly colored does not necessarily mean that it is going to harm you. In fact, the two most dangerous snakes that you have to worry about are the northern copperhead and the timber rattlesnake. And as you can see, my goodness, do they blend in with their environment. Um, these are the only two venomous snakes in New Jersey. If you do not see these two types of animals and you're like, my gosh, what is this? It's 99% a safe snake, 1% meaning that someone jumped a snake, but again, that rarely happens. Um, you're gonna see these guys in dense woods. They do not like people. So especially if you are hiking or if you have a house that is in dense woods. This is really what you have to look um, out for. Um, copperheads, the only difference between uh, an adult and a baby is, um, as you can see, 
they are brown, different brown undertones. Um, the lightest of their brown will be gray. So they're kind of like uh, gray and, and dark, but again, same patterns, tinier snake. Most copperheads are, are quite some big. Timber rattlesnakes, they just look the same um, when they're young. Um, remember how I said that most snakes don't pair up together unless they're mating? Ha <laughs> well, these two individuals um, love to uh, hibernate all together in groups. So you'll have a large group of northern copperheads. You'll have a large group of rattlesnakes. Sorry, I think that was my sorry. It's my my mic. Okay, no problem, no problem. I was like, oh gosh, is that my back? <laughs> so as I was saying, um, uh, they they they'll pile up together to hibernate. So um, if you find one, you might find multiple, um, which is just so great when you're dealing with two very dangerous. Uh, animals. Um, it's called communal dens, um, if you are wondering. And then fun fact, which I actually learned, is um, they do have a set of fangs. All um, of these snakes, they're, throughout their lives, they'll shed their fangs, um, but they only have seven replacement fangs. So they'll do it seven different times, and that's just the trivia in case you ever need it one day. The term for uh, snakes who hibernate together are also called gregarious, in case you'd like to know that uh, specific term too. Now, the bad news is the northern copperhead makes no noise. Um, the best way to know if you're by a uh, northern copperhead is um, just by seeing it. Again, they camouflage really well. So announcing yourself, making noise. Um, again, they can smell you. They want to get out of your way. Sometimes they'll flick their tails in the leaves and it will sound like rattles. So that will give you a, a heads up. But it's really, really important, especially when you're starting to garden or wherever you are, to listen. You, you have to listen and make sure um, that that you, you don't walk you know, on top of these guys. Most of them, uh, they just don't like humans. So they're, they're gonna stay away as best as possible if you want to hear a timber rattlesnake. Now, bear with me, friends. Um, this worked perfectly in the test. <laughs> but we'll see. But this is the sound, and hopefully you can hear it. This is a timber rattlesnake. Awesome. Now, let's see if it will let me go to the next slide. <laughs> During our test run, it was not letting me go to the next slide, but I'm glad this time it did. So those are the two you got a heads up for. You might also hear the northern ring, uh, ring neck snake is also venomous. Um, technically, yes. However, um, the venom is not as potent to really hurt a human. Not to say that you don't want to go to the hospital if you get bit by one of these guys, um, but, but you're not going to be as uh, in danger as the other two. Why do I have a cat here? Well, if I owned a cat, I'd be one of those people that took my cat for a walk, um, just like this lovely animal. Um, small animals like dogs, cats, maybe you walk your pet rabbit. If it gets bit by a ring neck snake, that's when it's really gonna get in trouble. So that's how it's dangerous, um, more so to your small pets. Um, and again, the same thing, um, if you're if you're in an area that you're just not too sure if a snake's nearby, don't have your pet walk ahead of you, have it walk on your side. And again, announcing most of the time they hear you, they smell you, they don't want anything to do with you, and they'll just go on their merry way. Um, but what happens if you get bitten by a venomous snake? What do you do? Um, obviously, you want to stay within uh, five feet, especially keep young children and pets um, at your side for control, like I just mentioned. Um, most snakes, you might get lucky. Um, most of them, it's all about energy in the nature world. They don't want to use their venom if they don't have to. So they might do what's called a dry bite um, that doesn't inject venom because that takes a lot of energy out of them. Um, but if you really step on them or you're messing with them, they're going to bite you and it's, it's not going to be good. You need to stay as calm as possible because this uh, venom all involves clotting of your blood. And as gory or weird you might get about that, it's true. You want to stay calm because you don't want your heart to be pumping quickly. Um, immediately call um, 911 and uh, do not attempt to drive yourself to the hospital. Do not attempt to suck the venom out of the bite. Um, if you can, take off your shirt and use it as a tie to just um, restrict the area. Um, but that's the best you can do. Truly just keeping yourself calm by meditating until help can get there. 
Um, so who to contact? So like I mentioned, the Division of Wildlife, Fish and Wildlife, again, they're really great, especially if you have a copperhead in your garden. Don't even bother using the hose technique. It's not worth it with these animals. Um, but I love Venom Bite, as it co it's called. It's a online database that um, will tell you um, snake uh, by state, basically, and, and what to look out for and what type of venom and everything you need to know regarding those two species. And like I had mentioned, oh my gosh, my alarm's going off. I'm so sorry. Hold on. Oh. <laughs> How do I turn this off? Hold on. I get it's always something new. <laughs> so, uh, so I, I know there was a couple of questions in the chat, which I'll ask um, Amelia when she's ready for a break. So I cannot win today. What is it? <laughs> and I'm not even cooking. Who knows? Maybe my house is on fire. It's all good. We're going to keep on going. But yeah, I can take questions right now. And in fact, that was our questions break. So let's do it. Okay. There were two in the chat, and and again, people are sending them to privately to me versus to all panelists. But um, so, oh, sorry, where is it? Um, Joanne was asking about moving baby snakes. Is it okay to, you know, um, what if what if you have to move a baby snake? Yeah, all good. So most baby snakes, um, believe it or not, some snakes uh, give birth live. Most of them are uh, in eggs, but reptiles are not like mammals. They lay their eggs and then goodbye to you. You're on your own. Um, so baby snakes can be moved, um, which is probably a smart idea because then they don't get accustomed to your garden. And and most baby things are harmless to begin with because their mouths are so tiny, so you can easily move them. But don't worry, mom's never coming back. She's not going to get upset that you're moving her babies. She placed them there probably because she thought your garden was absolutely perfect. Um, so try and find something similar. They need water. They need sun. They need somewhere to hide. And if you can find that, again, within 50 feet of where you live, you're set. Okay, and the other one I see in here uh, in the chat is uh, what if moving the turtle is in 50 feet is in either way still leaves the turtle in trouble. That yeah, so so I understand where you're coming from, especially like, say, it's a highway, say it's a busy street and you're like, what do I do next? Um, it's hard with them because a turtle's mind is a turtle's mind and it's just got to keep going. Um, if you truly can't. Um, what I would suggest is that's really when you have to call a rehabber because they'll be able to kind of determine the math of where to place the animal. And of course, they're licensed to determine that, say the animals can't be relocated, say it's trying to live somewhere that's just too dangerous. There are sanctuaries and facilities that they could live in harmony under licensed people that know, you know what they're doing to take care of the animal. Um, for the rest of its life, as we all know, most reptiles live, you know, 20 plus years, especially turtles. So these guys are going to be around for quite some time. Okay. And then, so then also, I think you had said um, that if you do move a turtle, let's say if somebody is moving from the street, that they should keep it going in the same direction it was already walking towards. So if they need to go across the street and drop it off on the other side. It most likely isn't going to turn around and come back over that yeah, way. Yeah, it won't turn around and come back. It's headed that way. However, if you're if they are going this way and you pick it up and put it back, it will turn around and keep going. It's like, nope, nope, I'm on a mission. <laughs> they are, they're very adorable, but they are truly, truly on a mission when it, uh, it comes. Usually they're going to get water or something like that. It's something that they know, so. Okay, and there are a couple more, but I'm going to go ahead, Patty. You do some Q and A's. Um, I didn't see anything in Q and A. Oh, I just see a red dot. It must be from the other answers. Okay, um, there is um, Thomas put in. Doesn't the shape of the snake's head determines whether the snake is poisonous? That's a very good question. Yes, um, most vipers have pointy heads. You can also um, something I left out of my presentation because I don't know if anyone would do it, but you can look at their eyes. Um, venomous snakes have more of a, a vertical pupil. Um, it's like a cat. Um, it deals with the spectrum of. Uh, color that they can see um, because they are able to see at night and, and, you know, different forms of light, making them the ultimate predator. Um, 
who is going to go up to a snake though and be like can i just see your eyeballs real quick up up it's a snake if you uh if you get that close they're going to go after you so it kind of is a moot point but yeah if you're able to um look at their heads if they're pointed um that usually does mean danger there are some variants it's hard with these guys because there are so so many different types of uh, reptile species and everyone is just a little bit different the majority though that statement is absolutely correct Amelia, I just wanted to mention to you that I see northern fence lizards mm -hmm. um, frequently out in the Pine Barrens. So we'll have to take a hike so you yeah. can see them. <laughs> I think I have pictures of them too. I'm about it. I um, The I last one was this fall at um, near Chatsworth. Yeah, nice. I am yeah. ready. I'm ready. I've lived again. I'm a Jersey girl at heart. I need sea lizards. So, so are there any other questions before my CO2 alarm decides to go off? <laughs> no, you, you're good on my end here. Oh my gosh. Okay. Let's yeah, you're get good. going. You just got to laugh though, because these are problems to have, right? Okay. I don't know if I did this slide, so uh, I'm just going to do it again. Um, I had mentioned before about moving an animal. There are strict trapping regulations and laws. You can get severely fined um, if you trap illegally. Um, again, most reptiles, uh, amphibians, um, actually almost every wildlife is protected under uh, this plan. So uh, you, you just can't live trap. Uh, and I just wanna make sure that when I say move an animal, like I said, within the parameters of 50 feet. Okay, so that was my question. So we're just gonna keep on going. So here's an activity. Can anyone tell me what animal ruined this garden? I had to reopen my chat box. <laughs> didn't have anything up at the moment. Skunk. Somebody said skunk. Heidi. Hey, skunks. Dog, chipmunk. Okay. All right. All good answers. So truly the answer is we have no idea because there are many varieties of animals that could do this. Dogs, chipmunks, rabbits. Um, what didn't create this though is a snake. Um, I'll tell you that uh, snakes never make their own burrows. They will borrow. And I'll show you a picture in a second. Turtles will make it to uh, for their, their eggs, um, but they'll back into the hole and dig out. They won't actually make a hole and then come back. Um, garden lizards actually make holes. That is something I learned recently. So you just don't know who did this to your garden. All you know is that you worked so hard, you spent a ton of money, and here comes Mother Nature with her animals, and she has destroyed your precious garden. Um, so how are we going to fix that? So I love this picture. He's so cute. Um, some signs of life to know if there's actually an animal inside the burrow. You want to see if there's spider webs or uh, debris surrounding the hole. If there is, um, there's nothing in there. Most animals are active two, three times a day. Um, there would be no way a spider could um, make its web in this hole um, in time. Um, you want to, if it's a snake, look for freshly shed snake skin. It looks like human skin, like peeled skin, just regular like flakes that you might see. So if you if your garden looks like it has dandruff, might be a snake. If if you're lucky enough, truly lucky enough, you'll have the whole casing, which is really quite pretty, and then keep that as a souvenir. Um, any snake feces. Uh, snake feces are very, very similar to bird feces because they have the same type of cloaca. Um, so, so white mush, basically. Um, it's not like owl pellets where you might find bones or anything like that. Um, uh, snakes digest everything. Um, so those are just some signs of life, especially with snakes. And again, I love this picture. He's just so happy. It's like, hello, come to visit me. Um, so, <laughs> the reason I put this in here is because in our program, you might have seen that there is a frog. Um, and the reason why I wanted to make a point of this is that some people don't know the difference between reptiles and amphibians. And so we decided to include a couple. So this is actually a southern leopard frog. And it is a live photo that was taken. Thank you, Patty, for uh, sending that. Um, but 
uh, amphibians are different than reptiles. And you're talking about salamanders, you're talking about frogs. Um, here are just two examples that you might find. Um, it's okay to feel confused because a lot of people are confused on what the difference is. And it's just basically involves metamorphosis. So think of frogs, think of tadpoles. Uh, reptiles don't do that. They have the egg, the egg develops similar to a chicken. It hatches and it's an animal. Whereas a frog will lay an egg, it becomes a tadpole, goes through metamorphosis and becomes an actual actual frog. Um, they are, they're different than most reptiles too because they have porous skin and not dry um, and they like water and land. So they're, they're, you know, uh, two in one stone kind of thing. So um, one thing I also want to mention for people who um, are in the Pine Barrens, we actually have a tree frog. I did not know that, but it's true. It's native just as I mentioned that um, it's seclusive, those pine barrens are so in their own world, really. Who knew that the, we'd have tree frogs, but we do. Um, so if you see these guys and you think, oh, what a cool reptile, now you know, nope, they are amphibians. And they too will go in your garden. Aside from reptiles in your garden, you're going to have a ton of birds, a ton of different land mammals. Um, I want to mention that if you are interested, we did do a recording last year on finding uh, what to do if you find an orphaned or injured wild animal that I presented on. So that might be something to follow up from this presentation. So you know, goodness forbid you are gardening or outside and you come across an injured animal, what to do. Um, and I just put this in here because I know if you're if you're outside, you're a nature person. And if you are interested, there are 969 insects that you will find in your garden that the reptiles are eating. Um, and you can go to insectidentification.org to really see that log. It is so, so cool. Um, so I, you know, all of these animals are really a chain. You have your insects um, that the birds are eating, the snakes are eating the birds, maybe a raccoon, a bear um, are eating the snakes. It's a circle of life. Um, and in order to have a really great garden with really great soil, you need to make sure you have a proper ecosystem and animals just come with that. Um, so maybe you're one of those people who is a garden enthusiast and uh, you want to make a habitat garden. There are so many that you can try birds, bees, butterflies, um, rain gardens, water gardens, uh, anything uh, that has a different theme that you might be interested. Heck, have them all if you're really that hobbyist. That's going to be me one day. Um, and you also have to really look out for how much sun or shade your gardens gets to determine what plants to put in there. And depending on the plants you get, depends on which animals are uh, come and, and call your garden home. Um, I always recommend finding plants that provide year round diversity. So if you think wildlife, they need food, they need uh, water, place to hide, place to raise, the, raise their babies, or just again, lay uh, eggs. Um, so they're going to need flowers, different shrubs shrubs, um, different uh, uh, fruiting plants that attract insects. Um, and that's why I love, it's called Plant for Diversity. It's a website, which I'll show you in a second. And they have what is called a native plant finder, which is this website. And I love this because you put in your, uh, your zip code um, and you can find native plants um, and figure out how to bring your garden to life. Um, I found it such a helpful resource in really making sure your garden is animal friendly. Um, another reason why you'd want to have an animal friendly garden is because of amphibian decline. It's kind of a mystery why this is happening, but a lot of frogs, a lot of sal salamanders are just disappearing and it's, it's scary. Um, and there are scientists who are actively working on this and this is why we always want to support them and their initiatives. One of the ways is to work with the National Wildlife uh, Federation. Um, and you can do this by creating uh, a protected habitat for amphibians. And I find them to be really quite cool. Um, you can use broken up clay pots to make a place of hiding. This provides a really nice cool area. Of course, you want to have an area that they can get water. Um, but what a lovely touch to a garden, you know, and especially we all have them broken pots that we no longer need. And now here you are helping wildlife. Another way is if, say you don't want your wildlife in your garden per se, but you still understand that they're going to be in your backyard. Um, you can make them their own wildlife little habitat. So what this woman has done is she has 
dug a hole, uh, I don't know, let's say six inches deep again so that cold air is there. She has filled things with logs. Underneath the logs are rocks. And again, you've made an area where not only bugs can hide, but uh, frogs, snakes, you name it. And they are still in your backyard, but they're doing their own thing in their garden, leaving your garden alone. It's a win-win. But nevertheless, <laughs> what do you do if you come and you find a turtle eating the best heirloom tomato that you have grown? I have watched my father tend to his garden daily for months and then ha ha, there's a, there's a beautiful tomato and it just needs one day. And he's got, he says to me, you know, I'm gonna come and pick this after work and he does and this guy has already gotten to it and you just wanna be fed up with mother nature because you love turtles, but it is eaten your prized possession. Um, so how could you keep them away? Um, so there are some natural remedies that I wanted to go over. Um, there are chemicals that you can use. I don't wanna promote them because of all of the watershed problems that they cause. You can do your own research into the effects. You can find um, different, sprays that might be less harmful to the environment. Um, this, leave it up to the plant experts, maybe talk to a farmer, talk to a local nursery, see what they have to say. If you wanna stick with natural, um, you can plant um, lemongrass, mint, lavender. Um, I've never seen what skunk cabbage is. I'm quite interested in what that is. And I learned something new myself, marigold. They don't like the smell. They don't wanna be near it. So what a lovely way to make a border around your garden. You can also make your own spray. Um, it's usually two parts, whatever the ingredients is on the right and one part water. Um, so it could be clover and cinnamon or just garlic cloves that are smashed, maybe just vinegar witch hazel is another one. And if you sprinkle your coffee grounds on um, the base of your garden bed, not only does that really help your plants, um, but frogs hate it. So your, your plants will be happy and there'll be no frogs um, in your garden. The, the plus side to this stuff, it's natural. Um, the minus is some of it's going to smell and also every time it rains, it's going to wash off. So this is a process, whereas the chemicals you can buy in the store are designed to stick. But that's really something to think about, um, you know, what's making it stay even through water and how is that uh, soluble in our lakes. So anyway. Um, you could also use good old fashioned fencing. I really am an advocate for mesh. Um, they cannot slither their little bodies through it. Um, they cannot climb it. Um, it's still pretty and you can still see through the wind is just fine, but it, uh, it's just a nice, uh, way to keep them out <laughs> in the most littlest of efforts. Um, again, they, again, they do love to climb, but I just can't imagine a snake climbing mesh. It, it just wouldn't work out, nor can they get stuck, which is really good. Cause just like we talked about with babies, um, you don't want them stuck at all. This is also another garden that I really liked. The opening for the wire is a little bit too big for my preference, but this is just an example of a DIY project that you could do. Um, the way that it is set up is that the PVC pipes are the doors that swing open. So your plants stay safe, nothing's coming in, nothing's coming out. Um, and you really don't have to worry if you're gonna come across a critter if this was my garden, I probably would use that mesh on the bottom um, again, because these holes, uh, a small snake or a baby could definitely go through. Um, something else, just as a recommendation, if you have a pool, um, who, how many of us have had wildlife stuck in there? Um, these are great, these little lifesaver ramps. I'll tell you, sometimes though, it makes it so they understand that they can go in the water and back. So you're kind of just investing in a $34 wildlife ramp. Um, so they're really good that if you see one, put it out and then it can escape, not leaving it out 24 seven. But it's up to you whether you want to, uh, advertise to your wildlife that, hey, party ramps available. Um, it might just be easier to, to get your garden broom or a net that they can climb up on and escape um, quickly. Um, but yeah, you will find a lot of uh, different reptiles um, in pools. They, again, like cool, especially if it's a really, really hot day. I think they're cute though when they're on the little ramps. 
And then if that not doesn't work, none of the remedies work, the, the ramp's not working, then you can convince your spouse to get you a pet guinea hen. Guinea hens are the best. Um, they are loud, loud creatures if anyone owns them, I know from experience, but they will tell you when there is a snake and they will follow that snake until it is gone. They do not like them. Um, they will, they're just the best security guards <laughs> and they're cute. I don't know if you can eat their eggs. If anybody's on this call that does know that, please feel free to put that in the chat but um, this would just be uh, uh, the most probably natural way of getting uh, reptiles out of your garden, it's actually any animal out of your garden, because nothing likes a guinea hen screaming at it or following it and pecking at it. So things I want to leave you with um, as a reminder, um, always garden in style, wear your socks over your pants, that's the gardener way. Um, the reason I recommend that is because Goodness forbid you do step on something and it bites, at least you're protected. And most people do not wear um, uh, covered you know, ankles in the garden and um, that could cause for some like problems. Um, if you are wearing shorts, wear long knee uh, socks, it's fine. Again, that is the gardener style and any true gardener knows that I garden a lot. I never wear shorts because I always get muddy knees. Um, always have your garden broom ready, like I mentioned. Um, when you are hitting the surrounding areas of your garden, don't slam it down. Just lightly tap, again, to let something know that it's around. Um, have a bucket just in case, because you never know when you're going to have to sweep up a reptile. Um, as I mentioned, announce to your garden that you're here and don't feel ashamed of it because the animals truly will appreciate. Um, if you are somebody that just cannot handle a reptile in their garden, uh, a, a real quick um uh what i want to call it like way to to remove them without any um any any reason for you to be out there with them is to play your radio for 10 minutes they don't like the sound they think humans are out so if you have a portable radio or maybe you're lucky you have surround sound in your backyard put that on for 10 minutes if you really want to perturb them especially your neighbors put hard metal rock on most animals really like classical, they're soothed by it. So you want to make them uncomfortable by playing rock metal. So 10 minutes, um, they just won't like the vibrations, the sound they'll leave. And that way, again, you do not have to worry about that at all. And you can go out and ease and you don't have to bring your broom because they have already left. And most, most importantly, listen, listen, listen before you enter a garden, um, listen for the rattling, listen for hissing, um, listen for different uh, squirrel or uh, raccoon sounds, anything that could make a chirp um, and be prepared to know that they're not going to hurt you. They just really want to get out of your way and, um, and you want to make sure that they get out of your way in harmony. And this is my public service announcement. Animals are not meant to be um, as, as much as they add such a lovely component to your garden, please don't dress them up. Um, as I mentioned, turtles, their shells are part of their bodies. They can feel things. So if you paint them, you're, you're torturing the animal. So if you want turtles in your garden or any animal uh, for that matter, uh, let their natural colors be uh, the pretty additions to your garden. Don't dress them up for your own sake. It, it doesn't help anyone. So that's my public service announcement to you. And so truly, I want to, these are all my sources. I truly want to thank everybody for uh, listening today. That is the conclusion of my presentation. It is 7.52 now. Um, I do have trivia in case anyone's interested, or um, if there are any other questions, um, I am more than happy to answer at this time. I am just going to stop sharing my screen. Um, I believe, Patty, oh, yes. I would. I didn't realize I was unmuted. I would leave, if you don't mind, leave your thank you screen up, because you do have a lot of. Oh, that's um, fine. Links on there that maybe yeah. somebody wants to copy and paste. And we can or just go over these really quickly. Most of them are just like uh, photo sources, um, but this is a great one, moving a snapping turtle. Um, so there are some really great resources that I would highly recommend you research um, and look up on. Um, there, there is one um, 
I get so much feedback. It's I, I'm going to kill my kids. In any case, um, <laughs> I'm only kidding. Uh, Lynette uh, put in in the chat. Uh, does New Jersey have water moccasins? She's seen some big fat snakes along the rivers. <laughs> yeah, do not worry. We do not have water moccasins. I laugh because when I was in Florida, that is something I had to worry about. And I was like, Psh, oh, my gosh, no, in Florida, you really have to worry about mo water moccasins. And of all the snakes in the snake world, um, if you ever are traveling to the south, you got to watch them because they'll charge you. Those are the snakes that want to go after you. Fortunately, in New Jersey, they just want to get away from you. So the ones that you are seeing in um, the water probably are black rat snakes. They do like to swim from time to time, um, depending on where you are in the state. In the state, but yeah, you do not have to worry at all. Um, we do not have moccasins. <laughs> Thank goodness. Amelia, I have a question. What snakes climb, like what snakes hang out in trees? Almost you know? all of them. Yeah. They um, do. Most of them do. The ones that you're going to see climb the most are guard, uh, excuse me, I was about to say garden snakes, garter snakes. Um, and those are the ones that you'll see on your grape vines, if anyone grows grapes um, or tomato vines. They love vines, they like hanging. Um, but truly, any ones that I mentioned in my presentation as well is in the guides that New Jersey Fish and Wildlife offer. They'll climb, they'll swim. Um, I, I don't think there's any that wouldn't, uh, maybe the larger ones, like the copperheads, um, like they, they won't, if they don't have to, that makes sense, but almost all of them will. And if you've ever had a chance to see a snake climb a tree, it's pretty cool. I'm sure it is. <laughs> I do see um, Ruby asked if we, if I can share the uh, sources page on a follow up email and yes, we can do that uh, Ruby. So I will, um, Amelia, if you can shoot that to me tomorrow, um, I'll, I'll take care of that and have Teresa send it out. So yeah, if anybody else has any questions, please pop them up in the uh, chat and in the uh, Q and A is fine as well. I'm seeing a bunch of thank yous. No, oh, thank you guys. I'm sorry my alarm decided to go off. <laughs> it's all good. There's a there's a, a Zoom bingo game, and I'm pretty sure one of them is that, that an alarm or a child screaming in the background. So now I get to officially mark X. <laughs> <That box. laughs> uh, yeah. But did you say you had a um did you say you had a uh, uh, a game to play or a I do, I do have some um trivia. Let me just get that up. Yeah, not, yeah, yeah. Because since I'm going to share the source now, you're good. Okay, so um, it's just by reviewing. It's not by the actual slide, so I can leave this up, which is fine. Um, and then whoever else is on the call, you're more than welcome to answer. But at this point, I'd say we're pretty much uh, concluded. So, yeah. yes, so, so, yes, when you guys, anybody that does leave the program, um, there will be a uh, survey to let us know how this uh, program, how you enjoyed this program. And if you had further questions that we didn't get to, you can pop it in there and also um, let us know, you know, some ideas for some new uh, topics as we keep going on with our talks this year. So, okay, go for it. Okay. <laughs> what is the most venomous, venomous snake in the world? I'm gonna read that one more time. What is the most venomous snake in the world? The black mamba or the inland tapin? And that's pronounced T-A-I-P-A-N. So the black mamba or the inland tapin? You could probably just put in the chat A or B. I'm reading some of them on the chat. It says mamba with a question mark. Mamba, yeah. <laughs> that was mine. <laughs> <laughs> so it's actually the inland tapin. Uh -huh. Um, that is very, very unlikely for them to strike, unlike the black mamba, which is actually quite a nasty snake. Um, but they have the most toxic venom. Um, they are not on this continent. They are over in Asia. You are safe. Um, but if you get bit by these, uh, unfortunately, there is no hope for you. Um, fortunately, again, we are not on the same continent. Um, by a guess, how many known species of reptiles can be found across the world? I, I'm waiting to see if anything pops up in the chat, yeah, but I do waiting. see. Uh, please put out the fire and stay safe. <laughs> Somebody put <laughs> that in the, uh, in the Q and A. <laughs> 
<laughs> that was RJ's. Uh, uh, just wanted to let you know that. <laughs> I know exactly what it is too. I I'm looking at it now. I, I love candles, but it's right above my, um, oh. my fire alarm, and I'm pretty sure. And if I don't have the fan on, I don't know if that caused it or not. But it turned off because I was about to be like, "What are we gonna do?" <laughs> <laughs> Everyone would take a journey with me to the the storage closet to get the ladder to go up there to turn it off. <laughs> So yeah, did anyone guess how many how many uh I'm not, seeing, I'm not seeing anything right no, now. No, I'm not seeing anything. All pro all good, all good. There's ten thousand in case anybody uh wanted to know that. And how many um people do we still have on the call? Are they have all gone? No, there's wow. still fifty over fifty. Awesome. Okay. We would have told you if they were all gone. <laughs> <laughs> right? Do chameleons shed their skin, true or false? Now, chameleons, most of the time, you can have them as pets, so long as you get a special permit. That's why I'm bringing them up. You'll never see them here. They're not indigenous to uh, North America. Um, they're more tropical. Oh, well, I see a true and a false. Yeah. So um, it is true. Um, they continue to grow as they get older. Um, if, if you've ever seen a baby chameleon, they are actually quite, quite adorable, but they continue growing and uh, they shed their skin just like uh, snakes. The only bad thing is similar to like lizards. Their, their bodies are so complicated that it just comes off in peels and not all in one like a snake. So you'll never get a true chameleon um, skin pelt or whatever you want to call it, um, which is too bad because again, they're super, super cool. Okay, let's keep going. Let me find a really good one. What is the world's largest living reptile? Komodo dragon or crocodile? Thomas put Komodo dragon. Uh, I have a crocodile here. So one, one. <laughs> I think it's the dragon for some reason. It is actually the crocodile, but oh, um, they're not, it's not too far off because uh, most crocodiles grow up to 20 feet. Um, I did not know this, that they could weigh 2,500 pounds. That is a lot of reptile right there. Um, whereas a Komodo dragon is only getting up to about 15 or 16 at most because their tails are so big, but they're maybe like a couple hundred pounds. They're not, they're not pure wow. meat. A crocodile so yeah you want to talk about um a uh, a scary reptile komodo dragons man thank goodness we don't live where they live because that's <laughs> i wouldn't want to find them in my garden <laughs> i would not want to meet either uh, <laughs> yeah. working at a zoo when those things were hungry you're like mm, <laughs> thank god there's a wall <laughs> yeah they said their tails they whip their tails right like a like a crocodile they 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 run they are they are huge they are absolutely huge <laughs> all right let's keep going um how old oh no we go back <laughs> oh no it was how old was the oldest turtle and i just lost it oh well that stinks i don't know um yeah now i want to look it up how old was the longest turtle Oh, old, wait, how old is the largest? Old, turtle? yeah, how, how long, uh, age length, sorry. Yeah. 150 years old, <laughs> if you're watching Nemo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Googling this right now. How old was the largest turtle? Because my, just because I cannot leave this conversation. Now, they said approximately 100 years old, but I'm thinking it's definitely longer than that. Turtles live quite a bit of time, especially like Galapagos and uh, and huge ones, so. They had, um at the Philadelphia Zoo, they have uh, some big ones that are, at, I know one's at least 80. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't, again, I, I don't remember the actual age of, of how old their oldest one was, but. 
Yeah. Yeah. And you know, what's crazy about those guys is, um, you know, back in the day before animal behavior was ever a thing before people realized, uh, that animals had feelings. Um, most of the science that we have today really wasn't created until the early nineties. Um, they used to ride them. They would have little kids that ride, rode them just like horses. Um, we know now that that's not good because as I mentioned, their shells are so, so sensitive. I can't imagine a saddle and a child, and how old, I'm not a mother, so how old does a baby weigh a four-year-old? Am I wrong to say 40 pounds? Would it be more? <laughs> like a, like a three or four? Could you imagine that on, on your, the most sensitive part of you on your back? I, uh, I don't know if I, I could do it. <laughs> yeah, I, I never did that with my kids. They have one at the, um, at the uh, aquarium, a, a brass one that you can ride. <laughs> yeah, brass good. Yeah. Brass good. Um, but yeah, and I think a lot of people think that uh, turtles can come out of their shells, and and it actually grows with them. So I find that funny. It's not just like their their shells so big and they grow into their shell. They're actually grows live tissue. You know. All right. I'm trying to think if there's any other ones that are really really good. Um, though. Sea turtles are carnivorous. Some of them are, I should say. Um, most turtles are what? Are they omnivores or herbivores? I'm going to put herbivore. <laughs> oh, Janet say, put omnivore? I'm going to say omnivore. I see a couple omnivores here. Yeah, good. So they are omnivores. Um, they will eat anything from, they love earthworms. So if you have a garden that's filled with earthworms, you're going to get turtles because they just absolutely love them. But just as we saw in, in my presentation, they'll eat your tomatoes too. They'll have some meat and they'll eat all the vegetables too. Um, so yeah, they are truly omnivores. All right. And my last one, which I finally got, thank God I got back to my, to my list. Um, how the oldest cold blooded creature was what's called, and I'm gonna pronounce it wrong, but it's the Tuimalia, and it's from Tonga Island. How old was it when it passed away? This is the oldest living reptile ever. I'm gonna say 150. 150? Tuimalia, that's such a pretty name. I gotta look up what kind of reptile it is. It's probably some kind we, of lizard. We yes. have a one, 150 years old. A I 200, mm -hmm. 250. The answer is 188. That is the oldest living reptile ever. So <laughs> now that got me thinking, I always thought that turtles lived more, you know, 150 plus, but maybe science is wrong or I'm wrong. And the science is correct that they're more, you know, closer to a hundred years than, than 150 plus. So you learn something new each day. <laughs> So that was my last trivia question. And thank you guys. It's 805. So the people who did stay on past uh, this presentation being finished, I, I think that's awesome. Thanks for hanging out with us tonight. Yes. Thank you, Amelia and, and Patty and everyone. We still have 35, 36 people still on. So I want to um, thank everybody for joining us this evening. And uh, Amelia, I, I, I'm still not happy about the snakes. Uh, luckily, in my yard, um, I'm so far so good. But I'll take the, to the toads and the turtles and the frogs. I'm good there. Um, so I want to thank you again for your presentation and your um, your humor and the fire alarm uh, humor is all good. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. So, uh, I really thank you for the, yeah. the presentation too. I thought it was going to go off again. I'm like, oh no, 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 but it didn't. So, yeah. like, oh, and Cindy put in there said, uh, "Thank you for the info, and I hope I don't have nightmares." You won't, <laughs> Cindy. It'll be good. <laughs> You're welcome. Cool. So, so, thank you so much, Amelia. That was a great presentation. I learned a lot. Yeah. No problem. No problem. Now, do I stay on um, for a debrief? Or are we good to go? We're good to go. We can, you and I, we can all chat uh, tomorrow or the next day, whatever works for us. So I just want to thank everybody again for a great evening. And um, we'll see you hopefully in March. Thank you. Thanks again, everybody. Bye, everybody. And truly, thank you, Sue and Patty. You guys are awesome to work with. So thank you guys so much. Oh, Time, to Amelia. Time for some lavender tea and a good book. <laughs> I'm going for the glass of wine tonight. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, All right. I'll have to wait. <laughs> Talk to you later. See you, girls, later. Thank right. you. Bye-bye. All right.
ሰበይቲ ኣብ ሓደ ኣስቤዛ ኣለዋ።